Hello and welcome to this week's episode of The Failure Effect, a show about reclaiming the word failure and turning it, turning it into success. Sorry. So today we have a very, very special guest. I'm sure so many of you watching this show are already familiar with him and his story, uh, but today we're going to do a very focused um, conversation, right, on the subject of failure, whether failure actually exists or not. So our guest is Sam Gishuru, a well-known techpreneur. Welcome to the show, Sam. Thank you, Ayo. Right. So Sam has been in the tech space for many years. He's been employed, but he spent very few years in employment and then went on to become a techpreneur. He has founded many, many businesses. Some of them have worked. Some of them haven't taken off. Um, he's uh, founded platforms or rather co-founded platforms such as Nylab and Kuhassel, which is a gig platform. And he's currently the owner and founder of an online and offline, that's a hybrid school called Kidato. He's going to tell us a little bit more about that. So let's get straight to our special guest. Um, tell you. us a little bit about where you came from, how you were raised, and where your interest in computers came from. Thank you, where you are. Um, I grew up in Ongatarungai. Mm -hmm. um, that's where I grew up. Um, and my, my interest in computers was at the church. There's a gentleman called Willie Sowala. He was working for tel um, back then it was it was telecom it, was, it had a different name mm -hmm. and um, he would bring me magazines PC magazines because this so had an interest there was an old computer in the church and so <clears throat> I started knowing about computers from reading those magazines I think back then was when Dell was being launched and a few other companies that were very interesting mm -hmm. um, it was a very niche place uh, only a few people had found their passion in it but he was extremely passionate and he was extremely excited about tech and he was very well educated. And so he convinced my mother that I should go and study computers at uh, Kenya Christian Industrial Training Institute in Isli, KCT, that's what we call it. Mm -hmm. And so that's where my interest in computers started. Okay. Yeah. All right. So um, when you define failure, you, you say it doesn't actually exist. The only reason you would consider a project a failure is if you're married to a particular outcome, is this true? Yes. Um, say, for example, um, you have a goalpost and um, you want to hit the bar. If you miss the bar, then you failed. Mm -hmm. That is not what entrepreneurship is about. That's not what innovation is about. Mm -hmm. Startups operate on day one every day. You learn from the market. If you're a startup and trying to hit the goalpost and you miss, okay, and then somebody in the crowd jumps up and catches the ball, and then you hit it again and the next person catches the ball, then you remove the goalpost because you realize they're getting extremely excited about catching the ball, and then you put people at the back, and now you target to hit it to them so they can catch it. Now you're successful because you're making them happy and you're getting you know, some sort of results. Mm -hmm. And the goalpost is no longer what your target is. So you change. Mm -hmm. That may be a terrible analogy. Right. Uh, but in a sense, the idea is the fact that when you go to market, it's not a sure thing. Okay? Mm -hmm. You go to market, and then the market trains you, which yeah. means there's a very high possibility that you will shift the goalpost. Mm -hmm. So if you shift the goalpost, then people can call you successful because, I mean, if the goalpost was, you know, if the, if the idea was to score in the goal and the goal was small and then you've shifted it, now it's bigger and it's closer to you or it's farther and it's bigger and now you're able to put the ball in, then people say, oh, you're successful, you didn't fail. But you probably did fail in the smaller uh, goalpost you're trying to hit that was farther away or mm -hmm. that was carved in a certain sense. Right. So I do find uh, what people call failure is usually a learning opportunity. Mm -hmm. And... Unless you're learning one plus one, which is equal to, which is already exists, there's no need to innovate around it. Building a business is about learning what your consumers want to, to have, mm -hmm. how they want to have it, how they will use it, for you to now adjust to that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, I mean, I like that. I like that take on it, the fact that it is always a learning opportunity. Yeah. So what platform do you um, 
have you worked on that has given you the opportunity to sort of pivot, turn around, turn it into something else, and now you look at it and you're like, this is surprising. I didn't expect this to happen. All of them. Okay. All right. Every little thing I've ever worked on mm -hmm. since I started building businesses, it's, there's, it, was, it never turned out to be what I, I thought initially mm -hmm. I was going to deliver. Okay. Yes. All right. So let's talk about Kidato, for example. How did that start out? So... Um, Kidatu started in 2019, so a lot of people assume that it's a COVID school. It mm -hmm. was pre-COVID, right. but it wasn't called Kidatu. So I started homeschooling my kids. Mm -hmm. and, and the reason behind that was the fact that uh, there are a couple of reasons. And, and one was my kids, um, my oldest child was becoming a teenager. And the problem with that was I was traveling a lot. I was, um, I was in China, I was in Africa, I was just doing projects with Jack Mom, being in every other African country. I do remember a time I think I went to... Um, six African countries in seven, eight days, seven mm -hmm. and a half days. You know, I wasn't sleeping. I was sleeping on the flights. The next day I was in a meeting and sleep on the flight. The next day I'm in a meeting. Right. And um, I was exhausted. Um, I realized I was spending very little time with my children and they're becoming young men. I have three boys. Uh, and uh, it was, it, it hit me that it doesn't matter how much impact I have across the continent or how much impact I have doing business or how, much, how many billionaires and presidents I get to meet, when they stop talking to me, when they get to the age where they are independent, they will have no relationship with me. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I could have given them the best education, I could have given them the best exposure, but the one moment I want them to come for Christmas or come yeah. for Easter and hang out with me or go for a movie with me on a weekend, we'll have no conversation. Mm -hmm. Of course, you pick that as you're talking to them, you realize they have new friends or they've been bullied or this has happened, they're struggling with this, and then you realize if that's what you're hearing, how much more are you missing out on the two weeks you've been away? Because information for children is only present mm -hmm. on that 24 hours. It rarely goes to the next three days to tell you, oh, this happened Monday to me. Mm -hmm. They'll tell you what happened today, mm -hmm. on Friday. And so that was one of my reasons. The second thing was um, I was broke. Okay. <laughs> okay. I was thinking, oh, I had, uh, so I had stopped working with Jack Matt at some point uh, as, as that as, as was progressing during the same period. And I was, the contract was coming to an end and I realized I do not have enough money going forward for the next five, 10 years to sustain the cost of education on the education I was giving them. Mm -hmm. Because I also realized I was leaving Nylab as CEO. Right. I needed to hand over to a younger CEO. Uh, I had become the ceiling. Mm -hmm. um, the brand had become so associated with me so strongly mm -hmm. that Whatever I did was Nylab. Whatever Nylab did was Sam. That was, that's not a good business. Yeah. You want the business to, have, to be an entity by itself and carry out its own activities mm -hmm. in your presence and in your absence. And so uh, I was not going to get a salary because I hope I'm not CEO. Why am I getting paid? Mm -hmm. uh, just because you own a business doesn't mean you have money in your pocket. Yeah. You have to work for the business. The business pays you. And so I was like, wow. I wasn't broke, but I was going to get broke. Okay. Okay. And so, mm -hmm. I was, and then I started looking at the quality of education versus what I was paying for. Mm -hmm. So uh, when I look at the quality of education, then they, they, the thing was, wow, this is this is definitely a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, how can I cut the cost of education for my children? Spend more time with them, mm -hmm. okay, and give them better quality. Mm -hmm. And the option that I found was homeschooling. Mm -hmm. Actually, I was inspired by a guy called Vincent, Vincent Donye, uh, because he was, I saw a picture of him in the pyramids, in the Egypt, at the Pyramid of Giza, and he was wearing a Kuhasol t-shirt. Right. Okay, so there is a, my friend wearing my brand t-shirt on the pyramid, because that's what started the conversation with his children during a school term, mm -hmm. and asking him, hey, buddy, how are you doing this? He said, oh, I decided to homeschool my kids. I've been homeschooling now for the last X period, period of time. I said, mm -hmm. wow, really? Yeah, which means the money I'm saving from uh, the school, I could have taken them to, I'm being able to now take trips with them and immerse them in the experience of knowing the things that they can read about in geography and history and other subjects. Mm -hmm. That inspired me. And so it, he had turned the idea of education into an immersive experience for right. his children. So he invited me to a meeting in Karen for other homeschooling communities. I was really impressed by what they were doing. So we chose to go the homeschooling way. Mm -hmm. And um, so, I cut a long story short, we try homeschooling, we realize first, I'm still busy, I'm still handing over the reins of Nylab to the new CEO. Uh, my wife is working full time in an international mm -hmm. organization. And hey, so what do we do? We hired some teachers. Mm -hmm. 
And that's the first time we realize that this is really not good education. Right. Because now you have visibility. You're being able to see some of the teachers coming to your house and what they're teaching. Mm -hmm. They're seeing your child's attention span. This teacher is dealing with one-on-one -on -one with a student, and this student is not concentrating. So can you imagine if this student is in a class of 20 to 30 mm -hmm. with the same teacher? Yeah. I mean, literally, they're, they're not paying attention. They're True. not learning anything. Mm -hmm. I remember thinking about calculating down to the cost of how much I was paying per lesson for three kids in a British curriculum. Mm -hmm. And, I, and I, I remember comparing that and thinking, wow, every time I take an Uber ride for 300 bob, 500 bob, I rate the Uber driver, but I can't rate the teacher who's teaching my kid. And if you ask me what is the most important thing in my life, it's my children. True. It's a, such yeah. a conflict, right? Yeah. I can, I can rate an Uber driver and you know, they provide good service and demand better service from them. But I can't rate the teacher. I can't rate, I can't, I don't have visibility on what they're doing and the quality of service. I am working really hard to pay this teacher to deliver to me uh, independent, curious, confident children uh -huh. who are knowledgeable. Uh -huh. And if you ask me at the end of my life, what was the most important thing, I'll probably say my family, my children. So what did I do with my life? Uh -huh. And I think sitting there, I, was, I thought to myself, hey, if you really mean that your children are the most important thing to your life, then your eight to five should focus on your children. Right. So, so, uh, so I started paying a lot more attention to the teachers who were homeschooling. Mm -hmm. And then um, COVID unfortunately came in and um, the teachers couldn't come over. And um, between the period before COVID, I built, because I was still going to Nylab, I built a small, I was coding, so I built a small diary. Mm -hmm. Now that I was paying attention to them, I, was, I built a small diary that, uh, where they could feel what they taught. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting to assume that just because someone is a teacher and they go to the classroom, they will teach what they were supposed to teach. Mm -hmm. Teachers are like everybody else. Everybody else needs guidance and everybody else needs an authority over them to tell them, have you delivered what you're supposed to do? Mm -hmm. Even as a CEO, you need a board or you need advisors, you need mentors who keep you accountable to what you're supposed to do. So mm -hmm. assuming teachers are altruistic and they're going to do what they're supposed to do is really false. You know, they can go to class and teach something that's not in the curriculum or they can take their book and read and tell kids read chapter 15 for the next 45 minutes or they can just come to class for 15 minutes and step outside for phone calls to run their business back home, their Mpesa shop or their whatever business they are running. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so I build this accountability diary for them. When you finish a lesson, I want to know what you taught my kids. I want to know what assignment you've given them. Uh, and I want to know whether I need to go ahead and buy some pens and some, you know, canvas, whatever it is you might need, say, for an art class. Mm -hmm. I don't want to come home and get told that that's what they need tomorrow. Then I'm running in the morning to get them. Mm -hmm. And then I noticed another sp problem in the homeschooling sector because now you become part of a homeschooling WhatsApp groups and communities. There were challenges of books. You know, um, when you go to a brick and mortar school, you have a library, so you don't have to buy books as a parent. There were challenges of things like labs, you know, chemistry, biology, physics. How do these homeschooling kids access biology, physics, and chemistry? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you could see the questions being asked, where, where are you getting this? Where are you getting that from the WhatsApp groups? Yeah. And another problem that was quite, uh, was there was, a, which they had sorted, and they have sorted extremely well, is socialization, where, where there were co-op groups. Mm -hmm. So kids, every Friday, they can go to a, a co-op group where they can play and hang out and do art and all of this. So socialization is well taken care of and sports. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so those were the three things I noticed. And I thought to myself, OK, so I turned the diary and called it Swap Kitabu, where I wanted parents to swap books homeschooling parents to swap books. If your child has moved from year four to year five, there's another parent looking for year four books. They don't have to buy them. They can buy them from secondhand books from you, mm -hmm. which means the same books that every parent has between, you know, throughout the school year are swapped. And so we reduce the cost of books mm -hmm. and they are swapped either on a subscription basis or they are swapped on a, on a rental or purchase basis, whichever it could look like. So mm -hmm. I wanted to build what you'd call, uh, what Georgie Kuh ended up building called Peter's Library. Mm -hmm. That's what I build with Swap Kitabu. Um, so when COVID comes in, um, I thought to myself, hey, my teachers shooting, my teachers now have to still keep teaching my kids because my kids don't go to a brick and mortar school. There's no reason for them to miss school. Mm -hmm. But then they were sending us these what, uh, WhatsApp messages very early in the morning with Zoom links. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you have to wake up, copy the Zoom link from your WhatsApp, go copy it on the laptop of the child, and then the child joins class. So you have to wake up. Yeah. So there's an aspect of I don't want to wake up at seven. I want to wake up at seven thirty. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'm tired. I want to. You know, I don't want to wake up at six thirty. Set them up. So I I added the function for them to click a button from their homes, mm -hmm. and my child just clicks a button, and the Zoom link connects both of them. Okay. 
And that's when it hit me, wow, this could actually be the future of education whereby teacher is at home teaching, child is at home learning, and all I have to plug in now are the other aspects of the library and the labs and socialization. Mm -hmm. And I think I was, I was in the office, I was like, what would you call this if you were to imagine a good name? And of course, based on my experience with Nyla, on startups that people could have said failed, mm -hmm. based on those lessons, I said, okay, fine. How do you get a good domain name? It's short, it's descriptive, mm -hmm. it's memorable. Mm -hmm. And so I think I was running the afternoon, took a whiteboard pen, just wrote a couple of names, mm -hmm. and then Kidato, you know, was the one that stood out for me. Right. Uh, and I said, I'll call it Kidato. Mm -hmm. And so, again, it was more of my project for my th three sons, not anybody else. That right. was about mid-2020. Mm -hmm. By September, a lot of people had shown interest. Mm -hmm. And so I think on, so on September 7th, I launched it to a small group of people and I had 12 parents, mm -hmm. 12 students who, sh who decided to use it as a learning platform, full-time wow. learning platform. Mm -hmm. Uh, then we added the aspect of after school, where it's um, what you short, call them nano courses now, short courses for children, chess, coding, languages, art. Mm -hmm. So these kids were all at home. So in, when you, you know, they're all at home with the parents and parents are getting agitated. So mm -hmm. engage them in two hours on an online class with an expert teacher. And that really picked up. I think we ended up, uh, I remember the first month in 20, September 2019, we made 19,000 shillings. Wow. Uh, in the second month, we made about 70,000 shillings. Wow. In the third month, we made about 150,000 shillings. Okay. Right. And so uh, September, when he made 19,000 shillings, I decided, hey, you know what? Uh, I'm going to apply to Y Combinate. It doesn't matter mm -hmm. because I only have 19,000. $190 of revenue. Mm -hmm. So on, I think, remember it was 23rd of September. Yeah. I was working for uh, the garage in Karen. Mm -hmm. uh, I applied. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I got an interview. After a short time, I got an interview. I uh, went on a break, got an interview and uh, on 1st of December. Mm -hmm. That was a really good, that's a really good um, you know, a, a, a validation. Yes. Why Combinator, the first step is to get an interview. If you get the interview, then you're really in a good space. Yeah. Um, and there's a, there's a story around that as well. Mm -hmm. At that point, I was just, okay, that was me and my head of operation who was actually living in Switzerland. She was a Dutch lady living in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. She also helped to raise about $20,000, 2 million shillings around the same time mm -hmm. uh, because she was super excited about this. Uh, again, um, it's a question of execution more than there are not people out there willing to give you money. They have to see what you're executing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, um, oh, she raised $5,000, sorry, not 20. So okay. which was half a million, which needed to pay for Zoom licenses and things like that. Mm -hmm. It was more of a loan than it was uh, anything else. Um, and so, yeah, so that's how we ended up joining Y Combinator. Um, I remember I was tweeting out what I'm doing and one billionaire who follows me, I uh, will not mention his name, I slid in but my But you know, DM. we really want to know who this is. Yeah. <laughs> I will put that in my book in the future. Okay. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, I slid in my DM and said, are, are you doing this? Yes. I said, okay. I said, fine. Um, do you want to sit and pitch to me to just hear what you have to say? Uh -huh. And yes. I said, well, I was excited. Uh -huh. And so I, th I remember we scheduled the, the session on Thanksgiving Day and he forgot. Mm -hmm. So I was waiting on my computer, anxious in my SQ, yeah. just, you know, waiting to talk to this guy who I'd admired for over 10 years. Uh -huh. And... Um, then he calls me at 8 o'clock, like I forgot. I said, so can we do this tomorrow? I said, okay, so apologize profusely. And he was going to give me only 10 minutes. The next day, it ended up being an hour worth of conversation. Wow. And it was, it was one of the most impactful moments. Yeah. The lesson from that is what you tweet matters. Yes. <laughs> What you really tweet does matter a lot. The number uh -huh. of people who see what you're saying mm -hmm. are many, and if they're impressed by what you're saying, you'd find that they will keep on paying attention and eventually they will reach out to you. Mm -hmm. um, and so I remember at that point being really happy because I changed my Twitter habits after I trended for tweeting something carelessly in 2019. And so that was a good gift for me. Okay. Right. Uh, changing my Twitter habits, thinking about what I'm saying, understanding mm -hmm. that there are people who perceive me a certain way. And so whatever words I put out there mm -hmm. could be taken positively or negatively and being more objective and thinking a little bit more than just rushing to respond to things. Right. And so that's how we ended up joining Y Combinator mm -hmm. on 1st of January. Okay. Yes. Yeah. It's right. a long story. I and think we should stop there and go to the <laughs> next question.
<laughs> no, well, I think um, what I'm taking away from this is really, truly the best way to be a successful entrepreneur is to see a problem that needs solving. And I think a lot of people need to understand that. Like, don't just run into a business willy-nilly. Understand if there's a market need for it, you know. Um, but I'm sure that there are many other lessons that you've learned on during your startup founder journey, you know, things that other entrepreneurs yeah. need to understand before they walk into an opportunity they think exists. Yeah, and, and I think you got that right. Yeah. First of all, the question has always been, how do you identify a good idea that could become something that could, you know, could be big, whether your objective is to make money or your objective is to have impact. And usually the best ideas I have learned are problems that you're facing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I was not solving anybody else's problem are solving my problem. Mm -hmm. A couple of things come into play when you find an idea that you want to execute that is personal to you. Yeah. One, it doesn't matter whether person, people give you money or they don't give you money. Mm -hmm. It's personal to you. You want to see this thing exist in the world. So you will sacrifice going for drinks, going to, you know, watching Netflix and just think about it, read about it because it's personal to you. You're excited about it. That literally is the best foundation for any idea. Mm -hmm. Because your motivation is intrinsic. Right. It is not about being validated. I mean, appearing on TechCrunch is amazing. CNN and Bloomberg and people seeing you, that's amazing. It's a really high, those are highlights. Mm -hmm. Those are not the depth of it. Mm -hmm. The depth of it is, it belongs, it's yours. It's your, your DNA now, you own it. And even if it doesn't see the light of day, you're still happy because you spent time doing something that taught you new things, you know, you experienced new things. I had not written code for almost 10 years properly. Mm -hmm. This was the first time I was actually writing code. So I'd taken a class on Udemy, which I paid $14, Ruby on Rails. Right. So I had also contacted a young man who is now my head of engineering. He was about 24, 25 then, mm -hmm. and he was my mentor. And it was really tough to me on me. I mean, I'm in my 40s. Yeah. You know, his kid is half my age at that point, and he's teaching me coding, and he's tough on me. He's forcing me to read ma manuals and, and make references on the Rails documentation. Mm -hmm. And so there was all of that happening at the same time. So I was having a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. So that's a good thing. Identify a problem that is personal to you. Yeah. And then when you solve it, you have a foundation which is literally you. Mm -hmm. So whether investors come in, when customers come and complain about something, you don't get irritated. You're happy to find a way to solve it for them. Mm -hmm. um, when you make a bit of progress and success, when you user joins and pays, you're really excited. 19,000 shillings from an idea is good money. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, so that's one of the things that comes out from looking for ideas. The other, the other problem is you end up imagining a problem and imagining a solution and building it and getting frustrated that nobody else wants to use it. Mm -hmm. You know, because you imagine the problem or you saw the problem. Again, not all problems, um, you know, need a solution. Yeah. Okay. Um, and sometimes, you know, not all solutions have a problem. Like uh, there's a way, you know, that there are things you want to, the problem you see and you think it needs to be sorted out, but actually, literally mm -hmm. nobody really cares even if it's a problem. You don't have to implement a solution. Mm -hmm. to it. People are happy living with that particular challenge in their lives, you know. It's neither here nor there. It's part of just life. Mm -hmm. You get it? Yeah. So, uh, but other people now come up with solutions to problems they either imagine, okay, so they create a solution first, and then they f try to figure out whether it solves a problem, you know. Right. Yeah. So there's a, there's a twisted part <coughs> right, right over there. Okay. Well, I think for me, the most significant business that you've built that is an actual problem solver is Kuhasol, right? Where did that come from? Um... So back in, um, this must be a while ago, I used to be a freelancer mm -hmm. uh, on a platform called Scriptlands. So Fiverr and Scriptlands, I had accounts, I think 2009, years. So I was doing short gigs where you pay me 500 bob to, to, to implement a software for you or launch something for you. I get 500 bob, uh, f a five, f five or do five dollars to say, for example, deploy a CMS for you. That would take me about an hour, two hours, you know, mm -hmm. go to Joomla, take it, deploy it on the plus. So I get 500 bob. Uh, I was doing that on Fiverr or you'd get, say, uh, you know, Fiverr was $5 type of gigs. I don't know whether that has changed. I do script lands. Mm -hmm. and skip, script lands, I would uh, get paid for, for small gigs as well. And I loved script lands so much. It was a small company. I don't even know where they were. I could always find the right engineers or, uh, for, to help me with a project. I get a project, find the engineers on the same platform, we, we deliver it. And I really wanted to build that for, uh, for, for Africa. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, it took me almost four years to build it. Um, uh, because I did not have 
the engineering skills at that point necessary. So I could do common, I could get away with engineering, but I never went into the depth of it. And then it was really difficult back then because there are not as many resources as there are today. Mm -hmm. You didn't find manuals, YouTube videos, you didn't find Udemy or Coursera to provide the courses for you to learn to do engineering better. So you either went to engineering school or you had books. Mm -hmm. And I had not done that. I'm a self-taught engineer. Okay. So, um, so I, I drew it a lot in, in some of my books, you know, in my old diaries, there's a lot of drawings of how it could work until I met this guy called Billy Odero. Um, he had joined NILAB, mm -hmm. and after being in NILAB for a couple of years, I said, let's build this. So 2014, we started building it. Um, and then uh, as soon as we did the version one, uh, Billy gets to have, uh, got offered a full scholarship to Cambridge, and so he left for a year. Right. So he died. Mm -hmm. And then he came back again, and then we built it better, applied to Y Combinator 2016, got into the fellowship program, uh, and now we were validated about that. So the idea was very simple. Have small businesses post uh, jobs that include logo design, web design, brochure design, you know, uh, things simple as that, and then we connect them to engineers who could come over and offer that solution. Mm -hmm. The problem with that was massive. Okay. Uh, extremely. Uh, I could, we could spend an hour discussing the challenges of building a gig platform in, in the African market. Mm -hmm. And so Kuhasal really never, never took off. So it's kind of stagnated for a while. Mm -hmm. Now we are rethinking about how to redeploy it again. It has okay. about 60,000 freelancers across Africa. Mm -hmm. But still not, it's doing about 10 to 15% of what's supposed to do. Okay. Uh, and now we need to see how we can change that. Okay. But that was the genesis of Kuhasol. Of course, ideas again for the name was, hey, everybody you ask in Nairobi, what are you doing? They say Kuhasol too. Yeah. Kuhasol too. Yeah. So I was like, ah, Kakila Mtu ni Kuhasol too. Then let's call it Kuhasol.com. <laughs> it was just, it just stuck as a name and that's what it is. Right. Yeah. That actually makes a lot of sense, mm. you know. Mm. But... So you've mentioned the Y Combinator a couple of times, um, and we're going to get to that in a minute. But what I want to know is, because obviously tech businesses are raised on, you know, funding platforms. That's, that's where you get your money from, mm. from fundraising, from literally, you know, begging, pleading, um, asking, mm. yeah. whatever it takes. Yeah. So what is it like getting into the Y Combinator? First of all, what is a Y Combinator? So uh, I, the reason I'm ex always excited about YC, uh, for Y Combinator for short, is the fact that Y Combinator is what inspired Nylab. Yep. Yes. So back again to Nylab, mm -hmm. which was uh, when I met Tony Dongo, Nylab was a co-working space. I remember I'd been invited for a visit to the iHub. And the IHAB didn't even have seats. They didn't even have seats. They had us one desk and there was nothing else. The floor was not done. You know, mm -hmm. there was a funny curtain that was separating two sections. Pete's coffee was operating under the stairs. Pete was sh selling coffee under the stairs himself. Yeah. Uh, now Pete has about six, seven branches. Yeah. Um, and I was super excited about the idea of meeting just other people who were like me. They just got nerds and geeks. Mm -hmm. So it was really cool to just find your tribe there. I was so excited. I even offered to bring some of my seats from my office. I had a small office in town in Uganda House. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I met Tony Ndongo. And then across the hall was Nylab, the same exact space, uh, just the opposite side of the building. Um, and so Tony, uh, we talked with Tony and Tony, Tony had a very is very passionate he's very energetic he's a very good salesperson and had business development skills and i think by the third time we were having a conversation Tony was like join me let's do this mm -hmm. and so um we started doing it actually initially it was a social media space back then facebook facebook and twitter were just starting off and we were being hired by ngos to go train say farmers in Uganda or Rwanda on how to use social media to post what they're doing so mm -hmm. that they can attract more people to see what they're doing. This, this, some of these NGOs, I think, was it Oxfam uh, and Hivos? Uh, some of those organizations we are working with some of different organizations across Africa. Mm -hmm. So they'd hire us to create social media strategies for people uh, who were not aware of what social media was. Right. So I literally got paid to teach people how to use Facebook how to and, <laughs> and Twitter tweets. at that point, <laughs> yes. Um, and, and it was very exciting. <laughs> You know, um, then we said, let's turn it into a co-working space where people can come and work. And then um, I decided to go to, I, I thought to myself, I really love the space I'm in. And now I'm getting exposed to the space in Silicon Valley. I've been reading TechCrunch and Mashable at that point. I said, let me go to, uh, to California and just learn. Mm -hmm. I mean, the truth is, 
if I don't see, the vision has something to do with seeing. And if I don't see, I will just be, be building out of imagination. And so I had a bit of money saved and I, you know, it was my second time to go to the US. Um, and so I flew to California and uh, accidentally visited Y Combinator. Okay, yes. accidentally. Yeah, I, w I, I remember uh, Joe Musharu then was, a, was working for Google. I'd reached out to him. He did not respond to me because I wanted to see Google. I wanted to see Twitter. I wanted to see all these big companies. I didn't want to go inside. I wanted to see the building from outside. So I didn't want security chasing me away. So I was asking, hey, can you sh introduce me to somebody at Google? I can see what Google is. Yeah. Google is a building, right? Yeah. I'm not going to go there and see the search engine somewhere. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> And I was at, I had taken a train and a bus and I was at Google Mountain View and I was trying to go back to San Francisco, the city. And I was, I remember the security guy came over and chased me because I was using their Wi-Fi from the lawn. Ah. And then <laughs> a, a friend from, uh, I, I was chatting with a friend from the Netherlands called um, Luca. Um, I forget his, how can I forget my friend's name? Uh, Luke Dupont. Okay. And Luke said, hey, you know, one of my board members called Matt Nitzberg really lives in, in California and in San Francisco and he's actually near you. We were just talking. I'll ask him to come with his kind PQ. Mm -hmm. And so the gentleman came and picked me and then he was driving me around and he said, oh, I asked him, do you know where Y Combinator is? Like, yeah. So I can actually show you. We'll drive outside there, I'll show you. Then we drove outside there. I said, we can go in actually. And then he tells me this story about how he made his millions. It's like, oh, the founder of Y Combinator and me were, well, was working in the same company, very small, I think less than 10 people. Mm -hmm. And that's how we built the first company called ViaWeb and sold it to Yahoo for $40 million. Wow. So I'll go in and show you. But he rarely meets people. Okay. But then when I walked in, he was actually there in a building just like this, and he was fixing something. And then I introduced myself, and we had a one-hour conversation about what he had done. So he inspired me so much, came back to Nairobi and tried to replicate what he was doing mm -hmm. without the knowledge. Only had one hour worth of knowledge. Okay. I like. So <laughs> for the first five years, I brain from that one hour of knowledge and every other research I had. Wow. Yes. <clears throat> That's awesome. Yeah. Um, but then, once again, what does a Y Combinator do? So if you think about what Nylab is, yeah. that's what Y Combinator is, but in a larger scale. Okay. So Nylab would now, we came back and all we had to do was bring startups, people, smart people in the same room who are building different solutions and try to teach them how to do this mm -hmm. from the knowledge we are gaining. Right. What Y Combinator does is pick the smartest people they can find and invest money in them. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they'll say, well, you are, you're building this podcast called The Failure Effect. Great. Now pitch to us. Tell us why, what, how, when, where. And mm -hmm. they would go like, they'll give you $20,000, which is 2 million shillings or whatever it is now. Um, and you have a 90-day period. You don't go to the office, but you have dinners every week. You have meetings every week. I think those meetings are actually in his backyard, in his house. And then from there... Um, after 90 days, he would bring his investor friends, and now Ayua can raise another 200000 300000 mm -hmm. dollars, okay, to keep on scaling this. Because those 90 days, you're supposed to achieve specific metrics mm -hmm. that can make another investor interested, and they will tell you what the, what the investors will be looking for. So the first time they did this was, I think, 2005. And when he was telling me, so, so the person who's built, say, for example, Chad GPT right now, Sam Altman, was, a, on, was on batch one. Mm -hmm. Yes, those were batch one guys. Wow. Yes, so I'm on batch winter 21. Mm -hmm. They were on batch either summer or winter 05. Okay, so, so we are, uh, we are looms in the same school. So Brancheski, the guy who built Airbnb, is I think winter or, winter or summer 2020, 2010, 2011. Mm -hmm. And so literally all the companies you might imagine, Dropbox, um, I mean, Flutterwave, Paystack, uh, Kidato, you know, Airbnb, Heroku, mm -hmm. uh, Cruise, the self-driving car. I could mention multiple companies that you probably use their products today. We are all Y Combinator, Church GPT, so Y Combinator company. And so, um, so that's, how, that's how Y Combinator grew. So it only, tw twice a year, it would bring the smartest people they could find and uh, 90 days teach them how to build the product better, pitch to investors, raise more funding, and then now go build the companies. And they stay with you for the rest of your life, teaching you, investing in you, uh, providing resources for you, and things like that. Today, they take, I think the first time they took about 20 people or 40 people, I can't remember the number, but today they take about 600 a year, 300, 300, and they invest about, uh, I think 100 and, no, they moved from 150,000, they're investing half a million dollars for each company. So you can do the maths, each batch is 300 people times about five, um, Five hundred thousand dollars, which is for fifty, sixty million Kenyan shillings, 
And so all these companies go, you know, they exit. So there's about a bunch of billion dollar companies that have come from there. There are a bunch of $100 million companies that have come from there. A bunch of companies that have IPO'd as well. You know, very many. The billion dollar companies, of course, have IPO'd or acquisitions and all of that. Yeah. <clears throat> now, it's interesting because you've applied for the Y Combinator um, program six times and been admitted twice. So what happened with the other four applications, do you think? Um, the first, uh, so I can't, I can't remember them right now exactly what happened, but I mean, of course, the four were rejections. Uh -huh. uh, and the first time was not in the Y Combinator core program. It was in what they called Y Combinator, y Combinator fellowship program, okay. which is a, sm a lower version of the core program. And the second time was in the core program, which is, which is where I am in right now. Uh -huh. um, so there were rejections. They're like, I'm sorry, you do not qualify this time. I'm sorry, you do not qualify this time. Yeah. Oh, here, you have an interview. I'm sorry, you didn't pass the interview. I'm sorry, you don't qualify this time. You uh -huh. know. Then, oh, you qualify in this right. one. And then, so there was, I'm sorry, oh, you qualify for a fellowship. And then you we went for an interview. You don't, after the interview. So there were rejections from just application on email. And uh, two of them, one was... I accepted to the fellowship one was a rejection from the interview itself, so the second level, um, and then the one that we got accepted, okay. which was uh, winter 2021. Right. Yeah, so um, the Y Combinator interview is very interesting. Um, back then, they would fly you, if you got accepted in an interview, they'd fly you to San Francisco to their offices for a 10 minute interview. Wow, what? Yeah. what? 10 minutes. It literally is 8 minutes. Oh my goodness. Yeah, so you have, you have 10 minutes to convince them to invest in you. Uh -huh. And if, if you come there and you find people who have come from India, China, Russia, around the world for that 10 minutes. Okay? Mm -hmm. Yes. So it's ten, you walk in 10 minutes. It's, really, it's, not ten, it's 8 minutes because at the 8th minute somebody comes and knocks the door and now you have 2 minutes to wrap up and then Go back, to, uh, go back, wait by 8 o'clock tonight. You will know whether you're in or out. If you're out, you go get drunk or cry, and then you fly back home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is actually, I mean, how did you handle it? Because I'm sure by the time you get to interview stage, yeah. you're fairly hopeful that this will go through. I mean, you've come this far. Oh, right? you, you still know, because you've read, you've read stories of, of yeah. people who have been rejected. You've seen their tweets. You know, you do not, your chance is still super small. Okay, all right. Why Combinator has a what, a 1.5 or 3.5 chance of getting it, which is, which is like a, it's, it's, you have a better chance of joining Harvard or Stanford or right. uh, whatever than you have of getting into IC. Uh -huh. Yes. Okay. Yes. And there's like 20,000 plus applications every two cohorts. So that's 40,000 a year. Yeah. And they will only take 300 to 600 people. So can you imagine your chances are even, you know, do yeah. the numbers are lower. Yeah. So that 10 minutes is uh, you have to prepare. Mm -hmm. Like literally every second counts, okay? Every second counts to tell your story. Mm -hmm. You walk in there. There are no long formalities of, oh, how was your flight? It's, mm -hmm. hi, where you are? Hi. What are you building? Yeah. That's the second question. First is, hi, hi. What are you building? Uh -huh. And then say, I'm building failure effect. Mm -hmm. I have had five, ten ex years experience in media, and this is why, why, why? And this is a problem. This is a solution. This is our market. This is how much progress we've made. And then we try to deliver as much information in very short sentences as possible. And there are four people. One of, them, one of them is the guy who built Gmail. The other guy is the guy who built what? And, you know, you look at their profile. This guy built Gmail. So, yeah. you know, so um, I think he interviewed me once. Uh, and it was, pretty, it was pretty stressful. Okay. I'm <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> and yet, because your, last, your, your current project, Kidato, is a Y Combinator yeah. project, yeah. which means there must have been some secret sauce to you handling the rejections. So that's what I'd like to know. Like, how, how do you get around that such so can get back in the game and do it again? I think we flew, we flew with Billy to San Francisco. And we booked ourselves in a... We, we didn't have money, so we booked ourselves in a, in a hostel. And the funny part about this story is that hostel has four beds, right? Yeah. Um, so we both got the lower bunk beds. But Billy had this guy who got the top bunk bed. Uh -huh. And first of all, you're really stressed, right, about the interview you're about to go for. But the guy who got the bunk bed on top, for some reason, he used to wear skirts. And so... <laughs> <laughs> 
Is that the, the, the guy that's social media famous? The, there's a gentleman who's always wearing these nice pencil skirts. Yeah, I don't I mean, I even know who okay. he was. I mean, like, this <laughs> is where people were hippies were traveling across. They're doing mm-hmm. their thing, living in hostels. So I remember the next morning, my co-founder wakes up, looks at me and says, bro, we are not staying here any other <laughs> night. This guy swings his leg over and Billy has to deal with all that chaos. <laughs> and, and so we had to move to stay in a different hotel. Uh, and so anyway, so we, we, we got us, because we were paying $30 a night, right? It's, it's 3 4K a night and so you don't have money to spend and you yeah. have, you're hoping. Anyway, we, when, we, when we ended up there, um, um, when we were rejected, actually we went to a bar okay. with the other people who were rejected. Yeah. And uh, so because we, fought, we made friendships as we were waiting outside to go for the interview mm-hmm. and, um, and we, we just got drunk. Okay, okay. It's a good <laughs> we strategy. got drunk. We were all so sad. We were all so, you know, it was really heartbreaking. You know, we could, mm-hmm. you could feel the, the energy of people trying to just psych themselves up because you also know people who got accepted and we knew their lives would change. Yeah. Uh, and so along the way, you get used to the idea of, ah, the email of rejection has come. Yeah, okay. Mm-hmm. Great. So, so what? You okay. know, yeah. All and right. when you get accepted, so you really go out and celebrate because you know that now you've just joined one of the most, most impactful network you can be part of. Mm-hmm. But that is also a lot of pressure. Yeah. If, if, the, if the person who's been, if you went to a high school and there are people who were from four and you're from one, where Brian Chesky's who built billion dollar companies, mm-hmm. and you know within your class there are people who want to build billion dollar companies, then you have no option to fail. Right. Failure cannot be, you cannot blame anybody else if you fail. It's just yourself. Mm-hmm. And that is pressure that is absolutely probably the most pressure I've ever had in my life. Right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And this is, this is two years ago. What? Yeah. So you're probably still just, I, well, obviously you've gotten over it because it's, no, it's working. No, you don't. No, you, have, you haven't? You don't. How do you? You still have to build a company that matches yeah. your classmates. There's still that thing about you that you're always competing with other people without even mm-hmm. realizing. Mm-hmm. It's just the idea of you getting past the, the fact that you're competing with them and now you're competing with your own self, you're an older version of yourself, that it starts to reduce. But still at the back of your mind, mm-hmm. you know that if you make it like the other people made it, you'll be proud of yourself. Yeah. So the pressure is still there to make this work. It's just that it changes form and it stops being about them. It becomes about, you know, your own achievements. Mm-hmm. But, you know, like you can't say, oh, I don't feel pressure when I look at a white combinator company that was in the same batch with me now raising their Series A, which is 10 or $20 million. Yeah. You know, you, mm-hmm. you feel a little, oh my goodness, what am I doing wrong? What mm-hmm. should I do better? You know, things like that. Okay. All right. Now, <clears throat> also in um, the subject of raising funds and you're know, looking for partnerships, you've had opportunity to work with governments, right? Once. Okay. Yes. What was that like? Um, actually, what we did with government is that at NILAB, we, uh, we tendered for a contract. Yeah. Uh, it was a World Bank contract. Um, a lot of people think government gave us a, a grant, but it was a, 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 a contract from Kenya ICT Authority. Mm-hmm. And uh, they were really good partners. And what they wanted to do was pilot, um, pilot uh, an incubation program. So, because we were the first incubator in the sense of tech. So we, we won the tender based on the fact that we had started something. Right. Uh, by that time, I'd already bought Nylab from Tony Ndongo. Um, and so, um, so we tried that out. Uh, but other than that, I have never worked with government. Yes, there's a p- fact that the president came to visit. There's yes. a fact that I have had a, a couple of interactions with the, you know, of the former president, you know, the current president, and the one before that. But I've never worked with government. Mm-hmm. I have never deployed a project with government. That was the only project I deployed. It just right. gave. It just became bigger than than what it was in the media space because it was the first time a small company had won a million plus. Uh, dollars in a contract for something so innovative and so different Mm -hmm. and it was featured on Forbes Mm -hmm. but other than that uh, I don't I have not won any other government tenders I have never been given a government job I have never uh, you know worked in any government department Mm -hmm. Um, nothing it just everything you you probably could have seen maybe when the with the president did the KICC thing where we it was our own initiative as NILAB and at that point, Naila Ben Seven Seas and a few other guys, people like Vincent, who I mentioned earlier, who created a group of people and tried to convince the president to come and see what innovation is all about. So I do not have uh, an in-depth relationship of working with government at all. Uh, neither do I have 
have I ever received any grants from government. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah. Um, now, on to the next subject, which is very close to my soul, um, is mental health, especially for entrepreneurs. You have had co-founders, I think, for most of your journey, but then for solopreneurs, there can be a lot of pressure because you really don't have anyone to lean on. Mm. But even then, when you're dealing with whatever mental health condition you're going through that may or may not be induced by your entrepreneurship journey, you're still pretty much going through it alone, right? So have you had any instances where you've had to sit down and reckon with, you know, this is affecting me in ABC manner? What steps did you do to mitigate? So I have had uh, three experiences that I could just address. Uh, co-founder, Nylab initially, and then Solo, mm -hmm. who hustled with a co-founder, mm -hmm. and now Solo mm -hmm. founder. Mm -hmm. So I have had both experiences with co-founders and solo founder, right. as a solo founder experience. First, I have to say this. It's easier when you have a co-founder. Yeah. Always easier when you have a co-founder by a great percentage. You can share the burden. Somebody mm -hmm. can be, I could be here doing this interview with you, excuse me, and then my CTO or my co-founder is solving business problems, you know. Right now I can tell you top of my mind, I know there's an engineering meeting going on, there's a growth meeting going on, there's a culture meeting going on in the afternoon, and mm. I need to be in all of them, okay? okay? Yeah. As a solo fo founder, so as a CEO, I need to be in engineering for updates for the products we're launching next week, growth on the go-to-market strategy on what they're doing next week. There's a lot going on. Mm -hmm. I have to meet the teams later for culture so that we can play a game and get to know where everybody's at. So, mm -hmm. But I, I can't be in two places as a solo founder. Yeah. It's the second thing about being a solo founder is that there's what we call the bus effect. If you get knocked down by a bus and God forbid, touch wood, what happens to the company if you're a solo founder? It, yeah. That's the end of it. Yeah. Most of the time, if you haven't created structures of people to take over from you or created structures that can sustain the organization going forward. Mm -hmm. And so with Kidato, we made, I made sure I've created those structures. I have amazing managers. Whether I'm there or not there, they can run with it. That's why I'm able to be here. Right. Um, but I can assure you that... Um, uh, so so when I, on a co-founder first, the 99 or 90% plus of startups that fail, fail because of co-founder conflict. Yes. 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 So despite the idea, the fact that having a co-founder is a good idea, there are a lot of aspects that can cause failure having a co-founder. Mm -hmm. Usually it starts from expectations. What's your role? What's my role? Mm -hmm. Okay. If we are running the failure effect together, your role is to interview guests. My role is to find guests and deal with distribution. Mm -hmm. Okay. Your role is to interview guests and deal with finance. If those roles are not very clear, okay, then we are going to fail. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to interview people. You're trying to interview them as well. You're trying to look for guests. I'm trying to look for guests. They could cross over at some point, but have, there's, there's need for clarity. Mm -hmm. You're interviewing guests. I'm looking for sponsors for the podcast. There's a clarity of roles. Mm -hmm. That's number one. That usually brings a lot of issues. In tech companies, how it causes chaos is the fact that I am the CEO, you are the CTO, you're building the product, I'm supposed to be selling it. Mm -hmm. But I keep on asking you to add features and more features and I'm not selling what you've already built. So you get discouraged. Three months later, 10 hours a day, you are doing, you've done almost, you know, uh, what, 900 hours or six to 900 hours of work. I have never brought a single customer. You are so tired. I'm still fresh saying, oh, if we add this, our customers will buy, you mm -hmm. know. That, that, that causes conflict. Yeah. The second one is finance, and you notice that uh, finance can be an issue in the sense of, wow, who's getting paid what? Mm -hmm. Okay, so here I am, I haven't brought a single customer. Here you are working every day writing code, we're getting paid the same amount of money. You could start feeling, hey, you know what? You know, and that point you really don't have money to pay each other, so maybe you haven't fundraised. Yeah. So whatever little you had saved, you put on the table is what you're getting, 50,000, 50,000, and mm -hmm. you're doing most of the work. Mm -hmm. You're away from the family. I'm just there in speaking engagements and telling people how amazing we are building, but I've never brought in a customer. Right. So it's payments or access to those finances. You can find one person has more financial needs than the other person. So I have a family, you don't have a family, so which means I need more money, but then I'm doing less work than you. you know? Yeah. Another thing I think I've noticed along the way for co-founder conflict is um, equity. Mm -hmm. You know, again, think about the same setup. How did we split equity? Yeah. Is it a 50-50 split? 
Is it a 60-40 split? Did you come up with a for, uh, the failure effect idea? So you have 70-30, but with my knowledge and my network and my resources, I'm bringing more value to you than you could have had even if you had 100%. Mm -hmm. So why am I getting 30%? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yet it's my network you're tapping to in terms of sponsors, in terms of guests, in terms of equipment. Maybe I'm the one who knows where to get a, a recording studio easier, faster. That's a conflict. Mm -hmm. Equity split has to be discussed very early, agreed on. Finances have to be discussed early, agreed on. Roles have to be discussed early, agreed on. Mm -hmm. Okay? These are things that will cause conflict. The other is usually perception and communication. Yeah. You know, you didn't show up to work at 8, you show up to work at 10. And I'm, I'm unhappy because I showed up at work at 8 every single day, but you show up at 10, you show up at 11. Mm -hmm. And now we're having a fight because I'm thinking, why are you showing up to work late? Yeah. But you're the CTO, you probably are working until midnight. Mm -hmm. Which means every day you've worked longer hours than me. I'm just perceiving, I'm just assuming you should be in the office early. Yeah. You know, and when you come, you're probably tired. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the work you're doing as, co as an engineer is not visible to me, especially if I don't have engineering experience. You're writing back end, mm -hmm. and what I want to see is the front end that the button is working, and it's still not working. Yes. But it requires some back end work to be done. Mm -hmm. So communication is that this is what I'm doing tonight, so I'll, go, I'll show up tomorrow or this week at midday because I'm, 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 I prefer working at night as an engineer because it's quiet no phone calls, no interruptions, I can focus on code. Mm -hmm. and that's what engineers do, they work in blocks of, of time. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of issues if you have a co-founder, mm -hmm. okay? Learning to manage them is learning to manage, manage a relationship or a marriage. Okay. As a solo founder, mm -hmm. there's a lot of challenges again. As I said, the bus effect, uh, the, the, the narrow viewpoint, like you can, you, you can tend to get caught up in only what you think is right, but yeah. you don't have anybody to challenge your thinking, mm -hmm. you know, to tell you that direction may not work because of X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. You are not multi-skilled. There's no way unless, well, you're a genius, you can be extremely good software engineer, extremely good at building a growth plan and a marketing plan, extremely good at managing a team, extremely good with finances, okay, and managing all the finances, doing your taxes and everything else. And actually, time is finite. You know, you can only have enough time to do one thing. Mm -hmm. So whatever you need to execute as a solo founder takes longer yeah. because of lack of skills, you know, doing the wrong thing, um, you know, limited amount of time you can do this, lack of trust from investors who are like, okay, fine, we're giving one person money. They could literally just get sick tomorrow and we lose our million dollar investment. So, yeah. so there's all those challenges which now brings in the mental health challenges mm -hmm. in the sense that you're doing so much, you're not sleeping well, you're not eating well, yeah. you, are no, you can't take a break, you can't go for 21 leave days, mm -hmm. you know, or even a week, yeah. you know, something <laughs> breaks. Even when you're on holiday, Diani, chilling yeah. out, you're sorting out issues, yeah. which means maybe your girlfriend or your wife or your children are really unhappy because they're not getting the full attention that you need to give them. Mm -hmm. And then that brings the breakdown of... Okay. Of, and now, if, if you're solo, so you have employees who, their families, they have rent to pay, school fees to pay, medical bills to pay, you still are responsible for their lives. Mm -hmm. Even when you're on break, you, you know, you're thinking about all these things. Mm -hmm. So I guess the question I've addressed here is a question of solo or, or co-founders, yeah. which, which direction to go and how, and what you should look out for. Yeah. The question of mental health now comes from where? It comes from the pressure of all of that. Yeah. And... Um, Yes, I have had um, challenges mm -hmm. and uh, in the sense of I felt lost, I lost myself. Mm -hmm. um, I remember this one day, actually two years ago, after I raised the money and it was, um, I think it was April, um, I had just on record time raised $1.6 million. So this was the most amount of money I had for a startup that was less than six months old. Actually, it had just been registered for three months in mm -hmm. Delaware. So it was legally three months old. Yeah. And I've just raised the money. And I drove home, parked the car, sat in the car for a few minutes, like every other person who has a family who sits in the car before they go into the house. And absolutely from nowhere, I started crying. Oh. I cried and I cried and I couldn't tell why I was crying. And I was so sad and I cried and I was like, wow. I was like, when was the last time you cried, Sam? I was like, I couldn't remember. Yeah. It had been years since I sat down and I cried. Yeah. And, and I cried and I cried and it really broke me. Mm -hmm. And I, from that point, it was such a low journey because there you are, you walk up, you meet people, your friends, oh, congratulations, we saw you on the biggest tech 
magazine in the world, you know, listed over there having disrupted a full traditional model of education. Everybody is congratulating you. You know, you, you know, you know how this goes. You yeah. know? And you are so sad. You're just smiling at people. You know, uh -huh. uh, I think it ended up, uh, so, so of course my dad had been sick, he was, uh, he was on stage, he was on the, you know, he was on the last days of his life. Okay. So um, he died three months after that, and my grandfather as well. So oh. I was also dealing with that and dealing with the company and dealing yeah. with all that. But um, I have to say that it was the first time in my life that I thought to myself, you need to go look for help. Mm -hmm. And so I looked for a therapist. I think I went through three therapists before yeah. I found the right one, who mm -hmm. I'm still using to date. Mm -hmm. um, and so I do encourage, and so one of the things that made me go to therapy brings in YC again was the fact that YC has allocated us a therapist. Okay. Because they know this happens. Right. Okay. Uh -huh. And so she's amazing. And so, so of course, being an African man, being like, I could have to help for what? You know, you know what do you yeah. need? Yeah. You know, um, so it was really, really hard getting on that call with her. Mm -hmm. And then finally I got the courage to email her and say, you know what, I think I need help. Mm -hmm. And so... She told me, list down the things you're going through. So I listed them down, I sent them to her. And when we were talking on that Zoom call, I remember the shock on her face. First of all, this is the same person who's dealt with a lot of amazing YC companies. Mm -hmm. And I remember her looking at me and going like, wow, you are dealing with way, way more than an average human should be dealing with. Right. Way, way more. And the second thing is that you're so hard on yourself that you're not being able to do these things right. Yeah. And that was the first time I took myself easy and I said, hey, wow, okay, um, this is interesting. I always thought I was underperforming, that's why I'm hard on myself. So I'm overperforming based on my circumstances and based right. on the environment I'm in, mm -hmm. and I'm not soft on myself. It was the first time I learned to forgive myself for what people would call failure or things that didn't go the right way or the way I expected them to go. Right. And then from there I realized, wow, well, it's really good to have an objective brain. Mm -hmm. So I never see therapists as therapists to me. They, they are coaches, you know. It's why you are here. They are talking to me, having objectivity on what I'm going through because I'm too subjective. I'm too immersed yeah. in it. I cannot see, you know, um, what is in front of me. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so you come over and say, you know what, when I look at what you're looking at, this is what I'm seeing. And suddenly I'm like, I get more clarity. It's like my eyes stop being blurry and something becomes clearer. And I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, now I see them. And now I can choose which one to deal with. So I always think of my therapist as a coach. Uh, who has got, you know, the training in psychology. And yeah. um, because even now I still go once a month and I put things on the table and they're like, oh, yeah, this is how you're seeing it. These are the other three ways to see it. And I'm like, oh, I would never have seen that by myself. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Because the, my thoughts are, there's a pattern that I've grown up with. Um, and so I do encourage a lot of people to get therapy, even mm -hmm. if you're not building a startup, even if you're just going through life, even if you just got married, even if you just, just take, find an objective person who is not your friend, who is not your relative, who mm -hmm. is objectively looking at you, who you pay actually mm -hmm. to think with you through yeah. situations. Yeah. And then you have more clarity. Mm -hmm. It's the same concept of having a mentor or a, an advisor or a board. But in this case, it's a very removed relationship because you're paying for that one hour and you're mm -hmm. going to go back and think for yourself and solve right. the problem. I want to solve the problem for you. Mm -hmm. So uh, my experience at Nylab, I had seen all the young men come in and have mental health issues, but I had never realized the experience until I went through it. Mm -hmm. And usually I tell them, take a break, go to the gym, eat healthy, sleep well, whatever you could Google and find answers yeah. to. Yeah. It was never go to a therapist and sit and do this. Mm -hmm. I literally was their therapist in that case, which means I also carried all their problems with me. Right, you know, yes. You know, uh, because I was their only investor at that given point. Yeah. And so um, I remember one young man who came over in the morning, I think he had gotten, you know, he fired his whole team and he was dumped by his girlfriend. It was mm -hmm. just crazy, you know. Um, so yeah, get help. There's nothing African or masculine or, you know, about you that you can't get help. Get help. Mm -hmm. Or wait until it's really, really bad, you know, uh. because that's the other option you have. So you'd rather avoid that. Yes. You know, so you either get help early when you start feeling, hey, this, I could need help. Or you wait until you're at the rock bottom because usually you will find yourself at the rock bottom. Mm -hmm. And that's a dangerous place because your choices and the decisions you make are really poor. Mm -hmm. Just, I don't know how much time we have, but just to extend this a little further, when you have clarity, you're not likely to incline to drugs. Yes. Alcohol. Yeah. Uh, promiscuous behavior. Mm -hmm. 
you're not you can choose you can choose to delay gratification yeah you can choose to dis to, to, to delay pleasure because mm -hmm. you know you know you, you still have the capacity to get it when you want to get it mm -hmm. okay so you can say i'll drink on fridays mm -hmm. okay you know or yeah. drink once a week i yeah. don't have to drink every day mm -hmm. you know uh, i don't have to participate in this behavior because it's not necessary it doesn't add a lot of value to me mm -hmm. you know i can decide to not do it or i can decide to choose when to do it and with who mm -hmm. okay um and I was, I was reading a very powerful book by um, Jordan Peterson about the same thing. When you have clarity, you can make this decision. When you don't have clarity, then what you do is you're so, you're so low on yourself. You want to watch a movie that excites you. You want to drink alcohol. You want to be in with friends who are definitely not adding a lot of value. You find yourself super low in the decisions you're making. Now, mm -hmm. you take those two people, who is likely to make better decisions for their company? Right. You know? The one with the clarity. Yes. The yeah. So what you need is clarity, yeah. which means and how for you to get clarity, you need to do all the basic things, exercise, rest, you know, yes. whatever. But at the same time, you need somebody who points you out that what you're doing right now may cause problems in the future. Mm -hmm. So if you are wondering, do I go for therapy? Don't I go for therapy? Ask yourselves, what are the choices I'm making on a day-to-day -day basis? Mm -hmm. What are the things I seem inclined to do without even myself it's like they control me yeah you know yeah that i don't control them you know so you know i'm dependent on these things that are definitely not good in the long term mm -hmm. and then now you know you're in a point where you need help yeah yes okay. because when you can control those things when you can leave the club at 10 instead of three in the morning yeah you're now in control of that when you can say i need to sleep early so i can wake up and go run my podcast you're in control of whatever you were doing the previous evening, whether you're going for a party or you hang out with friends. Mm -hmm. Now you're getting more clarity. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So final question, because you've learned a lot over the years, um, and I especially really love the mental health confession because it's valuable for all of us, mm -hmm. you know. And obviously everything that you have gone through must have established some sort of structure right? Or a way that you approach starting a new business. So I'm wondering, when it comes to the Kidato School Venture, has it been easier because of everything that you've seen? No. Okay. <laughs> no, no. Just because you have clarity doesn't make it easier. Okay. Just because you have more knowledge in the sense of building a startup, just because you have a larger network of people doesn't make it easier. Mm -hmm. You're just stronger. Okay. And just because you're stronger doesn't mean it's easier. If it's 40 kgs to lift in the gym, it's still 40 kgs. doesn't matter whether you are, you, you are you're weak or you're strong. Mm -hmm. 40 kgs doesn't change to be 40 kgs just because you, you know it's 40 kgs or you've lifted 20 kgs before. Yeah. You still have to push it. You become stronger in handling the situation. Mm -hmm. Yes. Nothing gets easy. I mean, literally, I could live here and find myself in a very difficult situation in the office that I have to solve. Yeah. today or i may not be able to solve mm -hmm. you know i, I mean and, and you know i could the world is such that it doesn't make things easier for you you know mm -hmm. you become stronger or you don't this okay. is how i find the universe to be you're either strong or you're not to deal with the situation the situation does not change events happen right. they happen as they happen mm -hmm. it's up to you how you how you frame and reframe the story in your mind on how to approach the event or how you imagine you know, if, if, if the event is about to happen and you have anxiety over it, then the event is 10 times worse than it actually, than it actually is. You mentioned earlier that you had to leave a previous job to start this. The, the period between the two, the reason you're doing this now is because you realize it's not as bad as it yeah. forever. But mm -hmm. if somebody else had sat down and gone like, oh, this is the worst thing to ever happen to me, then they would have just, you know, they would have, as we said, their ambitions would have died, their mental health would have died. It doesn't necessarily mean physical body dying. Something would have died in them. Yeah. But, but the fact that you reframed your mind and thought, you know what, I actually have more time, I have experience, I have skills, I have uh, you know, a really good phone book, I can call different people, I could do this. It's how you perceived mm -hmm. what happened to you that changed mm -hmm. how you approach it. Yes. So no, it's not easier. Okay. It's not going to be easier. This, it's just because you've given birth two times doesn't mean the third child will take two months. Mm -hmm. They'll still take nine months. They'll still cry. They'll still be taken to the clinic. You still have sleepless nights. You still have to educate them. You still have to worry about their health, their well-being, all of that. It does not change even if you have 100 kids. Right. It will not get easier. You'll just get stronger 
because mm -hmm. you can anticipate the challenge and frame your mind on how to deal with it. Right. So literally, as we're going through life, I guess the question becomes that, oh, you will get your car scratched. Of course, it's either you come out angry wanting to fight or you go like, oh, cars get scratched. That's it. You know, so, OK, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. OK, let's go clean our cars and wash mm -hmm. them. You pay my bill, I pay your bill. OK, our insurance pays great. It's a difference mm -hmm. with the person who comes over and now they want to get in is how they frame that event that has happened. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So in my view, is it's not going to be easier building Kidato as it was building Naila. I'm just mm -hmm. stronger. Mm -hmm. And it's not going to be easier if I start a new startup tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm just stronger right. okay, in doing that. And every startup follows its own pattern. Mm -hmm. An online school, a hybrid school, because we're hybriding because of socialization and sports, a hybrid school like Kidato has never been built across Africa. Mm -hmm. It's the first one. There are no white papers to read. There are no books to read. There's no courses to take. We are the ones writing the books and the courses and the white paper. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. which, which reminds me, we didn't talk about what Kidato is exactly. Yes. <laughs> uh -huh. Yes. So what is it? How does it work? Okay. And how do we join? Great. So, so, uh, so Kidato, uh, the best way to describe Kidato is that it's a hybrid school, mm -hmm. okay, that provides academics online and socialization and sports offline mm -hmm. to provide a holistic approach to education. So Kidato is, has multiple products. On one arm, it has got the K-12 school. K-12 stands for kindergarten to year 12. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's primary and secondary school. Okay. Then our second product is online clubs. Okay, these online clubs are, um, you join online clubs and now you can mingle with other students and choose. From the online clubs, you can choose what we call pods now. Mm -hmm. Right now, we have a STEM pod. Okay. Science, technology, STEAM. Science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics. Okay. And these pods, we provide courses for you. So the child can come in and they can study sciences. And from sciences, they can, they can come to, uh, we are building a lab, they can come to our lab right now and for two hours on a Saturday do all the experiments with sodas and dissection and litmus test. Oh. And so they get an immersive science experience. Mm -hmm. And so they start thinking of themselves as scientists. Yeah. So, okay, so we target a uh, six to 18 year olds, right? Mm -hmm. on, the, on the children courses. Mm -hmm. So if it's technology, you come and start with scratch, you go to HTML and you, you can build your own websites. From engineering part, we teach them robotics so you can work with your hands and build things. Mm -hmm. And then art, of course, is art and mathematics is mental math, you know, and all of those things. And our focus is to ensure that first, uh, from the clubs, forgetting the online school first, because that's academics, on the after school enrichment programs is to ensure that kids are having such a beautiful experience around the learning that learning is not something that ends it's a lifetime experience right so our objective is to create curious and confident children who eventually become extremely independent okay and in the very early stages we want these children to know what they want to do what makes them happy mm -hmm. you know what gives them balance Okay, and automatically then that can be seen in their A's and B's when they do the academics, okay, which is the normal subjects in a school. Mm -hmm. And so we have the second product, which is those um, uh, clubs. The third product we have is, um, is what we call nano courses now. Okay. These are short, expert-driven, cohort-based courses for adults. Mm -hmm. You're talking about where you is running a podcast and we can have a class on how to successfully build a podcast business, have a class on how to successfully manage your personal finances. We can have a class on how to learn a new language. We can have a class on how to um, organize your, yourself so that you're able to take amazing holidays. So mm -hmm. there are things that en enriches their parents' lives, the kids that go to Kidato, or just adults. Right. So where you can come in and run a class on anything she's an expert on, okay. how to build your marketing plan properly for different types of businesses. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of people who want to take these short courses. The best part about them is that they're not like Udemy, they're not pre-recorded or Coursera, they're live uh -huh. wow. and they're short. Yes. So it's four classes, very impactful, hands-oriented. By the time you're done, you've literally improved your business massively. Mm -hmm. I teach in that class, Adult Startup Academy, how to build a startup from idea to fundraising, okay. all the way end to end. Uh, Kenon Muiti, who is an expert in finance, teaches personal finance in the same class. And we have a lot of other people um, teach, teaching art and other things. So we offer this to adults on our platform as well. Because our platform works for children, it works for adults extremely well. Yeah. Um, and of course, uh, so the other products we're developing right now. So back to the online school. Mm -hmm. How does it work? Classes start at 8 and at 2.30. No more class scheduled. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, you log in on a platform, you have a beautiful dashboard, you have your timetable, just looks like a calendar timetable, then Google Calendar. When you click, you see, you see all the classes and you see your classmates, and when you click, you join a class. Yeah. Our classes are very small, eight students per teacher. So you're all on Zoom, and then the classes are um, exciting for students. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know, they're fun, they're engaging, and so they're interacting with each other. They have a 10 o'clock break, a lunchtime break. They end at 2.30, sometimes at 3. Literally, our students spend four hours and a half in class. A normal okay. student in a brick and mortar school wakes up at 5 o'clock or 6 yes. o'clock to get on the bus. Akidato students wakes up at 7.30, has breakfast, and is in class by 8. Yeah. So literally, we are saving two hours of yeah. sleep for them. So kids need to rest. Yeah. Again, if the kids don't rest, this is why they're irritable, they're angry, they don't pay attention in class. Mm -hmm. You know, we remove bullying. You mm -hmm. know, bullying in school usually is not necessarily being pushed on the corridors. It's when you sit in a class and you lift your hand and people giggle, people pass notes. Yeah. You're comparing your shoes to the other student's shoes, your yeah. bag to the other student's bag. You know, you're hearing stories of where they went for holiday and you, you afford, can't afford that holiday. Your self-esteem starts to dip. Mm -hmm. When you're just, a part of you is being seen on the screen, everybody is equal. Mm -hmm. All you can do is try to help each other. There's no bullying. Actually, when a new student joins Kidato, they have they are, their class is seven and there's an eight student. They have seven friends immediately. Because all they do is like, this is what you do with them. This is how you submit your assignments. This is how you submit your diaries. So in our platform, after the end of every class, teacher sends assignments out. Kids have to submit their assignments. They have to scan what they need to scan. They have to email what they need to email. They have Google Drive, so they're extremely tech enhanced. They use Slack for communication, mm -hmm. you know, workplace tools. That's how they do it. And then they can choose clubs and join sports or STEM, the STEM pods, and they can do those ones later. Right. We do our international exams uh, with, a, uh, with other, we partner with other schools right now. We've already done international exams twice. Um, literally, we are teaching the British curriculum. Mm -hmm. And from here, you can go to any university in the world. Okay. So these, you know, um, it can be done like that. Mm -hmm. Our offline campus which a lot of people refer to nowadays is just a small space where we have a kindergarten and year one okay. because we do prefer students starting online year two so since we had a big office space we said let's run a kindergarten yeah. and also learn how to run a school which has become very successful mm -hmm. uh, we've learned a lot it's okay. a beautiful space but it also serves as a social function for the students yeah. so every friday we have social fridays every other friday where students come and now we do the massive part of Learning. They mm -hmm. go to Gong Hills and go to the power stations and get to be told. They go to a planetarium and they get to have science. They go to Mobius and see how a car engine is made and how all the things, things are fixed. So these are scheduled. They go to a tea factory. They go to a farm. So unlike me who went to Jodamo once in eight years of school, these kids have already done more than 10 trips yeah. to different, you know, so we have factory visits that are scheduled. We have got other farm visits. We have corporate visits that are scheduled. We can bring them here to see how to do, to do a podcast. So they, mm -hmm. have a, they have a visual of what they're seeing. Right. The best part, again, I will just throw this out to you of an online school is the fact that if you're going to teach geography, imagine there's a difference between the student who's taking notes in class and the student who is using Google Earth with the teacher to explore, mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. the Mediterranean Sea, mm. the Pacific Sea, the At 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 Atlantic, I can never say that word correctly, or the Sahara Desert. They're able to visualize yeah. it, see it, have a sort of a, a personalized experience around it mm -hmm. while they're still taking their notes. Mm -hmm. The other kid in a brick and mortar school is taking their notes and all they can do in their head is imagine what the pyramid looks like. True. The one in an online school is actually not just seeing the pyramids or the catacombs, they're having a virtual experience through it in class. Mm -hmm. You know, they're seeing the structures, they're walking through it using, you know, different tools that we employ. Mm -hmm. It's a difference of retention. Yeah. If you ask one kid three months later, what is the Pyramid of Giza? They'll tell you about all of those things. And when you ask another student, they'll be like, oh, it's those things in Egypt and they're drawn like this. Yeah. This one knows what it looks like, knows where it sits. Mm -hmm. They can zoom out. They can calculate the distance from where they are to where that pyramid is. They know exactly where it is in the map of Africa because they have visualized it, seen it. Mm -hmm. Yes. So kids get to have a lot of fun. Yeah. You know, one of our biggest challenges are the holidays because kids cry. They don't want they to. Don't want to. <laughs> I think the kid, there was me time last week, and I remember Monday morning this week, my son was so happy to go back to school. Oh, you know, wow. like you know, it was so exciting to see that. And and even when when um, when I meet parents over the mid time last week, they're like, oh, my kid is asking when we are opening school, when they can come back to school, or when they can do this, when they can do this. Mm -hmm. And so it's fun to see that education is no longer a pain for a students who go to Kidato. It's something they really enjoy doing. Right. And the underlying motto about that where you are is 
turn the main thing into a play thing mm -hmm. and the play thing into a main thing. thing. So if you're doing maths, make math playful. Mm -hmm. If you're playing Minecraft, make Minecraft educational. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Yes. And so mm -hmm. in that sense, a child is able to differentiate whether they're playing or learning because mm -hmm. the experience is the same. Yeah. Yes. I am so going to apply yeah. that to <laughs> my son and yeah. his own journey with his education. Yeah. Finally, um, let me just add one thing. We, yeah. we, uh, how do kids keep time? Do you need an extra house help? You don't. When you show up in class on time, you get daughters. These are merits. We call them daughters now, starting yeah. uh, next week. And these are, these are virtual currency mm -hmm. that you can actually trade off in the near future. Okay. You can buy things that you need, Minecraft skins, mm -hmm. you know, all of these things that you do. Mm -hmm. So you literally, we have implemented a financial model on your learning experience that shows you show up in class on time, you get some merits. Uh, submit assignment on time, you get merits. Help your friends in class, you get merits. You know, uh, teach something new in class, get merits. All these categories of things. And when you, these merits are actual virtual currency that you can go ahead and claim uh, and pay for a, a science club or pay for something else within the platform using yeah. the things you've earned. Mm -hmm. So you can use them to, to buy a new course. You can use them to, you know, uh, buy a virtual, a virtual good or actual physical good. Mm -hmm. Okay, so these are the things we're implementing going forward, uh, making sure that the learning experience is also coming from the child's desire because they're like, wow, if I go to class right now and I do these quizzes and I submit my assignment terms, I'll get these merits. I can use these merits at the end of the year to trade off for this thing that I've really been wanting. Mm -hmm. And so learning becomes also a process of teaching them the discipline and ethics of work. Yeah. Okay. Because as a grown-up, when you go to school, most of us didn't know what we were doing in school until campus. Mm -hmm. Okay, this uh, it couldn't associate the, the education with real life outcomes. True. Okay, but if you can do that for kids from as young as seven, eight years old, that you can, they can associate their learning from real world outcomes. They can buy ice cream, mm -hmm. they can buy a toy from their learning and from their, their doing their work. Then you're really enhancing their learning experiences. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Agreed, agreed. Okay. Where do we find your campus if we're looking for an on-site visit? You just Google Kidato Campus. It's in Lavington. Okay. That's where we are at. But if you go to our website, you just click. Uh, you can download the school fees brochure or you can, you can actually book a free consultation meeting. Okay. If you're unsure whether this is something that works for your child or not, and that's super acceptable, we don't mm -hmm. find it works for your child. Mm -hmm. Most of the things I hear from parents are, oh, my child really, really likes the socialization plan. I'm like, why don't you try it out and see how much your child will actually like this structured socialization we have. Yeah. Is you can come for a, tri a trial class. You can mm -hmm. take a trial class. You know, mm -hmm. a week, a child can join us for a week, and if they like it, you can stay. If they don't like it, you can literally just take them back to the school they've come from. Yeah. And so we do have trial classes. I don't think there's a school that gives trial classes. Okay. Yeah. I might take you up on that. Please do. So, ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. The very talented, very wise, very experienced Sam Gishuru. Now, if you want to find out more about Kidato School, please feel free to use those uh, handles and contact details that you see in front of you. And in the meantime... Thank you so much for your time. It's been right. an honor. And we will see you all next week for another one just like this one. Thank you.